So how are you gonna close this wound? How about this wound? What are you gonna do with this wound or, or this one over here? All right, today we're gonna talk about all about wound closure. We're gonna complete this series on wound healing. It's gonna be awesome. Let's do it. Welcome back to Citizen Surgeon. My name is Dr. Eric Pearson. I'm a pediatric surgeon, and I'm here to get you comfortable on the wards, in the ICU, in the operating room, and of course, to crush your exams. Now today, we're gonna do part five in our wound healing series. We started out with systemic factors. We went to local factors. Then we went to the wound bed and how to prep it. We went to dressings, and finally today, we are at wound closure. What does that mean, all right? Wound closure is how we bring a wound together or how we let that wound heal. Now, I've mentioned it in almost every video. It's that wound healing 101 talk, and it's really important for you to understand all those phases, all those cells. And really, today when we talk about delayed primary closure, I really want you to understand why the timing is so critical and those cells are important. So let's get started. What are the three ways that we can close a wound? So first is by primary intention. Second is by secondary intention. And third is by tertiary intention. And another word for tertiary intention is delayed primary closure. So let's get in to primary closure. So when we talk about primary intention or primary closure, this is the way that most surgical wounds are closed. Okay, so if I'm doing an excision of a skin lesion or if I'm doing an exploratory laparotomy and that's gonna be a clean or a clean contaminated case, I'm gonna close those wounds with primary intention or a primary closure. And that means bringing the epithelial edges together to facilitate healing. Now, there are a number of ways that we can bring those epithelial edges together. So we can use skin staples. Now, that is very common in vascular surgery, very common in trauma surgery or orthopedic surgery, not so common in pediatric surgery because those staples can cause some dis discomfort when they're coming out, okay? And I think that the cosmetic appearance of a wound that's been closed with sutures, Steri-Strips, or Dermabond is a little bit better than that stapled closure. That stapled closure can sometimes leave those train track marks of when the staples go through the skin. And I don't like that from a cosmetic perspective. The reason that stapled closure is a nice way to close is it's a rapid closure and with the intermittent staples, if you do have a surgical site infection, and I would recommend you check out that surgical site infection video, if you do have an SSI, you can easily remove one or two staples and drain that infection, keeping the rest of the wound intact. That's impossible if you do a running baseball stitch closure or a running subcuticular closure. In those cases, if you have an SSI, the whole wound needs to be opened up. So staple closure can be really effective in those traumatic wounds, vascular, of course, orthopedic surgery. Well, another way to close wounds is by Steri-Strips, all right? Now I'm gonna show you a picture of a wound I had on my leg, and I was able to effectively close that with Steri-Strips, all right? Another way is we can use sutures. So here is a little boy's eye wound. So perhaps he had a laceration or a traumatic laceration, or, or perhaps he had a, a dermoid removed from the eyebrow region that was closed with interrupted sutures. Now, if you are closing sutures in a child, I highly recommend using a interrupted absorbable suture, like a 5.0 fast absorbing suture. We talked about that in the suture video because you don't want to take those sutures out in kids because that process uh, can be quite challenging and put the kid in a little bit of discomfort. Okay, so if you are going to do a wound closure in children, try to think about how you could do that with an absorbable suture that you're not going to have to remove. And then finally, we have Dermabond. Now, Dermabond is you know, from a strength perspective, similar to closing something with a 5-0 monochrome suture. 
okay? And Durabond can give you really nice epithelial edge apposition. So for me, if I'm doing a laparoscopic clay case, I'll usually close with a deep 4 monocryl in the, the der deep dermis or the deep dermal layer, and then I'll close the epithelial edges with Dermabond. And in here, you can see that Dermabond was used to support the closure of a running subcuticular stitch on the abdomen. So when do we want to use healing by primary intention or a primary closure? Well, we want to do that in clean, contaminated wounds, okay? We also want to do primary closure, have the option for primary closure if we can get to a wound within four to 12 hours on the limbs of the trunk, within 24 hours for a face wound because that has increased vascularity, to close it with primary intention, or else we have an increased risk of a surgical site infection. And this may be a little surgeon or situation dependent, but if there's too much of a delay in getting to a wound, you know, for example, let's say you had a dog bite yesterday, it's gonna be pretty impossible to close that wound today without a substantial risk of surgical site infection. All right, and then finally, we want to do primary closure if we can close wounds without significant tension. Tension will lead to wound dehiscence. Tension can decrease perfusion, lead to ischemia of a wound. So I also wanna think about that, all right? Specifically, if we're excising masses on the scalp, the scalp can be very difficult to close. And so you may have to have some other tools in your closure bank. For instance, being able to do a Z-plasty to take tension off the wound or move some tissue around, okay? So those are the indications for a primary closure. And here are some wounds that we close by primary closure. So for example, here I had a laceration. I was out mountain biking, got a laceration from my bike pedal on my leg. I was able to remove the hair, wash the wound out, and within a few minutes was able to get a nice closure with stereo strips on this wound, and it healed great, no infection at all, okay? The second wound here is an example from a case that was a spine exposure, okay? So big wound, but it was a clean case. So after we finished the case, I closed this wound in layers and was able to give a really nice closure with no surgical site infection. And as a third example, an acute injury, so for example here, a dog bite, if I can get to that wound within six hours, I can clean that out and I feel good about closure, we don't have a significant tissue loss, the, in, the edges come together nicely, then I'll close that with interrupted sutures and there's good evidence that supports this practice with not having an increased risk of surgical site infection, and then we accompany that with the appropriate antibiotics. So this is how I close the majority of the wounds that I'm operating on, specifically for clean contaminated cases, or if I can get to the wound without too much delay and there's not too much tension on the wound. So let's go to secondary intention. So in secondary intention, the wound is not closed. It's left open to heal from the inside out. Okay, now why would we do this? Well, we would do this if we don't meet criteria under primary closure. So number one, it's not clean or clean contaminated, it's contaminated or it's dirty. Now I'm gonna talk about delayed primary closure in a minute, but if you have a contaminated or dirty wound, the risk of surgical side infection is so high that you'll have a better outcome if you choose to either do a secondary intention or a delayed primary closure tertiary intention, okay? Second would be if there's too much delay. So let's say you have a laceration caused by a trauma that was one or two days ago, okay? Or it's 16 hours old and it's dirty, contaminated, you had to debride it, get the gravel and the dirt out, and it's on the limb, all right? That wound you wanna clean out and perhaps put a vacuum assisted closure or a wet to dry dressing, okay? And that again is to decrease the likelihood of getting a surgical site infection, okay? Now, why is a surgical site infection bad, okay? Well, if this is a midline laparotomy closure, a surgical site infection is bad because it gives almost a 17 fold risk of underlying fascial dehiscence, okay? So we don't want to risk fascial dehiscence, so in that case, we want to decrease the risk of SSI and do a secondary tertiary closure. 
Now the third reason we might want to do a secondary closure is if we have too much tension on the wound. Okay, so if there's too much tension on the wound, then we have to leave those wound dentures open or do some sort of tissue flap or a Z-plasty of sorts to move tissue in place. But if we can't do that, then we may leave that wound open, get a good granulating base before we do a skin, a skin graft. Now you can see when you leave a wound to heal by secondary intention, you do have a less than ideal cosmetic result. So here are three examples of wounds that healed by secondary intention. And you can see there's quite a significant scar present, okay? We have an open wound on the axilla here. We have another wound on the back and then a gunshot wound that healed by secondary intention. And all of these do leave pretty significant scarring. Now to give you an example of one wound and the closure modality that I chose, I have a wound here that was a pressure uh, sore on the, the back of an infant's scalp and that led to full thickness necrosis. And the, really the only decision that I could make was to debride the entire wound, get down to a healthy base, and then place a vacuum assisted closure device that got us a nice granulating bed before we could do a skin graft. And over the years, that resulted in a really ideal wound closure, okay? So let's go to tertiary wound closure, tertiary intention. So like I talked about, wound closure by tertiary intention is also called delayed primary closure. And this is where we leave wounds open intentionally for 48 to 72 hours and then close them primarily. So why would we want to do that? We would want to do that if we had a high risk wound. So for example, we're doing an exploratory laparotomy with perforated uh, sigmoid diverticulitis. We get into the abdomen, there is significant fecal peritonitis. We wash the abdomen out. We ended up doing our resection and we have an ostomy. We did a Hartman's procedure and now we have to decide on wound closure. Well, if we decided that we're just going to close the midline fascia and then do a stapled closure or you know, a, a running closure of the midline wound, there's upwards of a 25% risk of that wound getting infected. And as we talked about in the surgical site infection lecture, the surgical site infection talk, that leads to a dramatically increased risk of wound dehiscence. Well, we don't want that. So what are our options? Well, number one is to heal by secondary intention. Now, the downside of that is, okay, we have, you know, a little worse scar. But another major downside is the time. So if you're gonna have a big midline wound, even if you put a vacuum assist assisted closure device in, that's gonna be weeks to months to fully heal in. That's gonna be a significant cost burden to the patient. They're also gonna have to carry this kind of suitcase closure uh, device around with them, okay? So there are some costs, there is a burden to that. Another option, okay, is delayed primary closure. And so here, we leave the wound open. In the operating room, we're gonna put in the sutures that we want to close the wound with. So I may put a series of simple interrupted or perhaps even mattress sutures with a 2-0 nylon or a 3-0 nylon, okay, a permanent suture. And I'm gonna put those across the wound bed, leaving the wound bed open. I'll then put a vacuum assisted closure device within that wound and then hook that up, let that put on suction for a couple of days. And then between 48 and 72 hours, I'm going to take that wound back off. And then at the bedside, with perhaps a little sedation, we can close all those sutures. Okay, just time down. A lot of times you don't need to give any sedation at all. We can tie these down and now the wound is closed. Okay, now you have a primary closure of the wound. So why do we do this? Well, if we wait 48 to 72 hours, what cell is going to be the highest concentration in the wound? All right. Well, the macrophages are going to be with the wound. And if you remember, the macrophages remove debris and remove dead cells, even remove foreign body from the wound. So if we can get to this time point 
we can have a primary closure with a massively reduced risk of surgical site infection. And here are a couple of uh, papers, here's a series, as well as a systematic review, and I'll put those links in the show notes and you can check that out. But in contaminated and dirty cases, it can be very helpful to do a delayed primary closure so that we don't have the patient with the morbidity of a wound that's healing by secondary intention, but we also have dramatically decreased risk compared to that primary closure. So this is an excellent option in these contaminated or dirty cases. All right, so I hope you enjoyed that today. A short video on wound closure. There are three major types. We have primary closure and you can choose. Do you want staples? Do you want sutures? Do you want buried sutures that are absorbable, okay? Do you want steri strips? Or of course, do you wanna use Dermabond, all right? Uh, second is secondary closure. So here, this is where we have a contaminated or a dirty wound, we have a risk of surgical site infection, and so we want to decrease that by leaving the wound open, perhaps using vacuum-assisted closure or wet-to-dry dressings or one of the other dressings I talked about in the last video to get that wound to heal with decreased risk. And then finally, tertiary closure or delayed primary closure is an option we have specifically in contaminated or dirty cases in the abdomen to decrease the risk of a fascial dehiscence by closing the wound when our macrophages are highest in the wound at 48 to 72 hours. And always remember, you gotta leave those sutures in in the first case so you're not putting sutures in at that 48 to 72 hours because that can be, as you can imagine, very uncomfortable for the patient. If you like that video, give it a like, give it a share. Remember to subscribe to the channel. I hope you enjoyed that series on wound healing. And as always, stay safe, study hard. I'll see you next time.